Right. Well, there's uh, no one in the waiting list, but we can add them in uh, if anyone else comes. I think we may as well get started, seeing as we've got a really interesting evening ahead of us. Um, great. So, firstly, thank you all for attending our um, a webinar, the second in the series. Um, and tonight's we're all talking about uh, the issue of primates as pets here in the UK. I'm Sam Threadgill. I'm the director here at Freedom for Animals. Also, we have Nicola O'Brien. She's our fundraising and communications manager. And we have our guest, Rachel Havasey, who's the director of Wild Futures, the monkey sanctuary uh, based down in Cornwall. Um, so uh, I'm just going to do a little introduction and then um, I'm going to pass this over to Rachel, who's going to talk about uh, the wonderful work that Wild Futures does. And then we're going to we have a few questions uh, for Rachel. And then um, at the end, we're going to have questions from the audience. Um, so if you, if you come up with any questions throughout tonight's uh, webinar, then please do uh, just add them in the chat box. Uh, and we shall uh, we'll read them out uh, at the end. Uh, and of course, if you only come up uh, with questions at the end, then again, just put them in the chat box there. But any questions, uh, type them in the chat box. So ending primates uh, as pets has been one of Feeding for Animals uh, campaigns for many years now. Uh, and there's like thousands of these animals that are kept uh, in domestic settings uh, throughout the UK. And we believe that no animal uh, should be confined to a life of captivity. But the issue is particularly clear when we're dealing with uh, these animals who are highly sensitive, highly intelligent and uh, are really sociable animals as well. Uh, and they're really not suited uh, to the way that the thousands of them are kept uh, in the UK. Now, recently, back in October 2020, uh, we exposed the Manchester uh, pet shop that was selling uh, marmoset monkeys as pets. And our investigator found that uh, these six uh, monkeys that were held in this pet shop, uh, they were divided up between two uh, wire cages, which uh, we estimated to be around three meters squared. Um, one held two uh, adult marmoset monkeys and the other one held uh, two adults uh, and their two babies. And what was particularly heartbreaking about that case was that uh, there was a small sign on the um, on the cage uh, of one of them that said that the babies had already been sold, and the next babies, the next litter of these uh, mama was that monkeys had also mama monkeys, sorry, uh, that had also been sold. So not only are they kept in in these like wire cages for uh, for everyone to see in these um, uh, in this pet shop in the middle of Manchester, their babies are sold on to to who knows, some private, um, some private collector, um, which is not soon after they're born. So there is good news that um, we are edging finally towards uh, a ban on the practice. Um, the Conservatives have um, pledged to bring in a ban. Uh, and between December and February um, last year and this year, there was a consultation by DEFRA uh, looking at a proposal to uh, at least bring in the majority, let's say, of a ban um, on primates' pets. Um, there are a few issues with that, but perhaps we'll, we'll discuss those later in the evening. Um, so it is a, it's a very murky world and not, you know, there's around uh, 5,000 primates that are kept um, throughout the UK, but this is a, you know, a, a massive estimate. Uh, and many of these animals suffer um, kind of behind closed doors in a domestic setting. So kind of getting to the true nature uh, of what's really going on in the primate pet trade uh, is something that's quite difficult to do. But someone who does know an awful lot about the trade and who will enlighten us to both uh, the issues surrounding the primate pet trade and the work that Wild Futures uh, Monkey Sanctuary does to alleviate that is Rachel Havasey. So, Rachel, over to you to uh, talk a bit about the work that Wild Futures does. 
one sec. Uh, uh, you're just on mute there, Rachel, if you could yep. just, there we so, are. So yeah, no, thanks very much, Sam. And thank you for inviting me on, giving me the opportunity to share um, our work at Wild Futures with, uh, with you and your supporters. Um, that's really appreciated. Right. Okay, so I can share the screen. And there we go. Okay, so I'll get going with um, just, I wanted to give a bit of a background to um, our work at Wild Futures um, and uh, perhaps yeah, just give you a, a sort of an outline of both what we do and what the issues are um, involved in the pet trade. As you've said, Sam, it's a, a really sad situation which involves an awful lot of suffering. Um, however, I would also say that um, there is a, a glimmer of hope on the horizon that things are, are starting to change. Um, so, Wild Futures is a, a UK-based uh, charity uh, specialising in protecting primates um, and both the welfare and conservation of primates. Um, we are often asked, why is a a primate charity, specialist charity needed in the UK. Um, and there are two main reasons. One, of course, is that worldwide primates are under threat, um, and that is as, as a species on a conservation level. Um, so we think that over 60% of all known primate species are now threatened with extinction due to human actions. Um, populations are declining drastically. And of course, many of you, you might be familiar with some of these issues um, that are affecting uh, primates in the wild. Habitat loss, the terrible scenes that we're seeing, particularly in, in the Amazon at the moment and in Indonesia, as deforestation um, seems to be on the increase. Um, then there's the trade, pet trade, um, which involves both the um, trade of animals in the wild, um, it often means that uh, a large population will be affected. So for, it's estimated that for every 10, um, for, every, for every primate that, arrived, that goes into the pet trade, at least 10 ha have died along the way. Um, the most common way to hunt them is to, of course, is to um, shoot the, the mother and or the defending uh, adults in order to take the, the babies uh, for sale. And the trade also involves the bushmeat trade, which is a, also a massive problem, both in the Americas and in uh, Africa. Um, and climate change, something that we shouldn't forget, um, something that we all are increasingly aware of, um, and we really need to be so. Um, so at the moment, a lot of the talk is around affecting human primates, but of course, the uh, the effect is um, quite catastrophic on all our fellow species, and that includes uh, uh, non-human primates as well. But the, the charity, uh, Wild Futures, um, focuses on promoting welfare and conservation of primates. The second branch, of course, is looking at ending the trade in primates, um, and particularly in the UK, um, we need to start at home in order to be able to hold up our heads when we're talking with governments and conservation organisations um, in, um, in range states as well. And part of that work um, is offering a home for life to primates in need. So we have a sanctuary. We're only able to rescue a relatively small number, um, but we know that the problem is much bigger. Um, but if our flagship project, the Monkey Sanctuary, does mean that we can highlight the issues. We can offer respite and, a, and sanctuary to, to some of those monkeys, um, primates that have suffered, um, and uh, focus our educational work there as well um, to get legislation changed, to get the law changed, and to help people understand why this is a serious welfare and conservation issue. Um, but a lot of our work um, is very much holistically based. So we're looking also at 
conserving and restoring natural habitats, um, private ones abroad, but we also again need to be focusing on what we're doing um, in our own homes and the sanctuary um, very much believes in um, managing its own grounds to help um, promote the conservation of, of UK wildlife. And this all needs to also be underpinned um, by sharing what funds that we have, um, by uh, supporting projects abroad, um, skills sharing, um, staff secondment. So using our skills, our knowledge and, um, and understanding um, to share with others, to help raise capacity elsewhere. And this is all based on many, many years of experience. So we're, we're uh, all of us working currently um, for the charity, uh, if you like standing on the, the shoulders of those that have been before us. Um, the sanctuary, the Wild Future Sanctuary is probably actually um, the first, was probably the first primate sanctuary um, in, the, in the world. So in 1964, when it was founded, um, there really wasn't such a concept. Um, there were animals in the wild and there were zoos, um, but the idea of rescuing and, um, and, and linking the issues of welfare and conservation um, was really in its infancy. Um, so yes, uh, we're proud that we helped um, to, to build this e that the ethos of, of sanctuary. Um, in the early years, um, and for many years, um, we rescued and, and focused just on, on woolly monkeys, which in the 60s and 70s were extremely popular as pets. They were being brought over from South America, um, dying at a very young age. Um, but it was easy to trade because there were very few international regulations. Over the years that did change, um, but what we were able to do in those years was to learn an awful lot about what primates needed and to learn a lot of lessons. We got lots of things wrong and I think there's some things that happened in those days that we would now see as anachronistic as dated and, and um, not um, relevant or, or um, suitable for, for work today. Um, but again, those, those are experiences that are important um, to recognise um, and to share with others so that people aren't constantly reinventing the, the wheel. And one of the things that we are proud of and that uh, we are known for um, internationally is the way that we have developed our social management techniques around the, the monkeys and enclosure design. So enabling relationships to develop, um, enabling um, the, the, the rescue and rehabilitation work um, to take place within a suitable environment, which both feels secure for the monkeys, but also gives them the freedom um, to make choices in their lives um, within the limitations of, of captivity. And so, for instance, um, the, all the enclosures are linked by uh, tunnels or, or runways so that uh, it's possible for groups to split up and come back together as they need and as, they, as the monkeys choose. Now, in the early years, um, the sanctuary was breeding. Um, we came to believe that that was not the right thing for the monkeys themselves, that they didn't have a future back in the wild. Um, and so in 2000, we implemented a non-breeding policy. And um, as our work looking outwards as well, both as a sanctuary and a charity, means that uh, we are on the board, we're both founder members and on the board of the European Alliance of Rescue Centres and Sanctuaries, very much part of our ethos of um, sharing our, our, our knowledge and skills, learning from others um, and working collaboratively. Um, and all of that sort of holistic approach has been recognised by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Um, and present we are actually the only sanctuary in all of Europe um, to be given the top level of uh, accreditation by, by GFAS. So this just slide here just to briefly illustrate our holistic approach. Um, so we're not just about primate welfare, welfare is about all aspects of life and we try to illustrate that and to live that um, in all areas of, of, of living, um, whether it's recycling all the monkeys' um, food and, and waste, 
um, using um, sustainable sources of energy. Um, the monkeys territory um, and the volunteer house is all um, heated with biomass boilers. Um, we use solar panels, uh, capturing rain water for the toilets, that sort of thing. Um, of course, we're passionate about education. Um, and that is from the very youngest um, school groups um, all the way through um, school, university, um, and on to, to government uh, departments as well. Um, and I should say that holistic approach, something that we were once looked on as being a little bit peculiar um, and much more accepted these days is an understanding of why, for instance, plant-based diets are a natural part of conservation and, and welfare. So, for instance, our, um, the, the food that we serve it, it will is plant-based. Um, and that is an opportunity for another conversation with our visitors so that they can see that um, all the different aspects of our work are, are linked together. We also um, seek to support uh, projects abroad. We don't have vast amounts of, of cash as a small charity, um, but we do like to offer annual grants um, to particularly to seed funds projects, which then helps them attract uh, further funding. And so these are some of the examples of projects that we've supported, both with money, but really importantly and very effectively, often it's by um, using our own staff and staff's secondment, being able to spend time at different projects and also inviting um, members of teams um, working projects abroad to spend time with us. Um, so again, sharing what we do directly. Um, these uh, uh, supporting these kind of projects, I would say in the last year or so have been difficult. Um, we've had to just focus on the sanctuary because of the effects of, of COVID and the effect on our, our funding as a result. But hopefully, as we gradually build our way back out, um, we will be able to do um, support more projects like these again. Now, other aspect um, of sharing our knowledge and skills and um, creating uh, capacity um, and what I call our uh, wild futures family, people who come and stay with us, learn about our work and what we do and take away with them the skills and the passion that means that they can go off and do fantastic things elsewhere. Um, and a really successful programme that we've been running over the last few years has been um, through European funding with the Erasmus scheme and in particular the European Solidarity Corps. And we've had a range of, of people, um, over, often over 100 a year, staying with us um, for between two weeks and 12 months. And the 12 month internships are really in-depth training um, and um, acquiring skills and knowledge um, from over a range of subjects, uh, whether it's um, learning about how a charity is run um, to helping the site team, um, looking at the mechanics of uh, the practical work of the sanctuary, um, to primate care it, itself. Um, and one of the things, again, we're proud of is just how many of the people who come and stay with us and take part in these training programs then um, go and find really um, good projects, uh, um, both in the UK and abroad, um, uh, both in Europe and in the field, and end up being really effective uh, in the field of, of conservation and welfare. But the, the, the UK pyramid pet trade, of course, is our, our biggest focus at present. Um, it would be lovely to say one day that it's not. And we look forward to the day when this aspect of our work is no longer needed. Um, a, a lot of our time has to be taken up with campaigning to end the, the primate pet trade. Of course, as a sanctuary, we are offering home to the victims of that trade. We also need to work to turn off the tap. And that's why we have, will spend as much energy as we can um, educating, but also working uh, with governments and government departments to get legislation changed. And you'll see here just, I think the pictures tell the story as to why it's necessary, um, the kind of enclosures that you see, the suffering involved. And this is all 
in the UK. And it's a pet trade that goes back an awful long way. Um, sadly, it's part of the British tradition. Um, there's a lot of evidence to show that, for instance, um, the Tudors were very fond of primates. So as, uh, as the, particularly the English started to go out and explore the world and build their empire, but they started to bring back what they considered the exotic and interesting animals. Um, and these included monkeys. So Catherine of Aragon is reputed to have had, uh, I think, 15 monkeys at her home um, in the UK. And that tradition has continued over time. Um, there's the famous hanging of a monkey um, that was found on a Napoleonic ship um, and thought to be a French prisoner of war. Um, I'm, I'm sad to say that the picture in the 70s there is actually of myself and my sisters um, innocently having our pictures taken in Cornwall on holiday. Um, like many others, as children, thinking it was a, a lovely idea to have the chance to hold and feel a, a wild animal on our arms. And all the way through to 2010, the pet trade particularly in the UK, really started to take off. So the early 70s, as the, um, the international laws came in that protected uh, the international trade of, of animals at particular sites, um, the trade, uh, the keeping of uh, ex exotic animals in the UK did actually start to drop off. And then in the early 2000s, um, people started to realize, the breeders and the dealers, that there were certain species that were more hardy than others and they could be uh, bred in the UK and sold that way without the expense and the difficulties of the permits needed to bring them in from, from abroad. And we believe that today the majority of primates in the UK trade have been bred in this country for that. <sighs> estimating, I think as Sam said, estimating numbers is really difficult um, because it's presently, it's legal to keep a monkey as a pet. There is no centralized registration scheme. There's no universal registration scheme. There's very few ways that we can track the trade and the numbers in it. Um, we have to rely on reporting from a variety of sources um, and um, looking at um, internet sales, speaking to people involved in the trade to get an idea of um, the, the numbers um, and likewise how, how the monkeys are entering the trade themselves. But 2021, we're still seeing this problem. This isn't something that has gone away. And today, this is a very typical cage here or here. Um, so the marmoset trade at the moment is the, the trade that is booming. Um, with some of the restrictions on, on keeping the licenses required for the larger primates, and we like to think that um, as we and our partners um, in animal welfare, as we've campaigned and educated, made things a little bit more difficult um, to acquire licenses, there are fewer of those monkeys um, in, um, in domestic homes, but those that require nothing and can be bought and sold with no, uh, no oversight at all, that's where the trade is really booming and marmosets are the biggest victims of that. Um, small, what they call parrot cages in the living rooms. Um, on the right there, um, are, uh, well, you can see it was a, a family of marmosets. Um, the young guy who bought these bought a pair and very quickly found he had an awful lot more. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been any close to a marmoset, but they do an awful lot of scent marking and they smell. And very soon they were moved out of the general living area of the house. And, this is actually into a downstairs toilet. And why is it wrong? Well, to many of us, sure, it seems obvious. Primates are intelligent, they're socially complex. They are wild animals, really importantly. Whether or not they're born in captivity, they still retain all their wild instincts and needs. And they can't cope with life in a domestic setting. And it causes all kinds of problems. Part of our, the, the problem in people understanding that the damage they're inflicting and having pet primates is that um, 
the abuse that we see is not so obvious. We often think of abuse as being physical violence um, or um, an animal with many with sores um, that looks obviously malnourished. Um, and yes, you will get that with some pet primates, but on the whole, a lot of the suffering is um, is hidden from the untrained eye or the, the, the uneducated eye. Um, and a lot of it is psychological suffering. Um, and I think um, my colleague, Sarah Hansen, um, looked up the, the, um, uh, the um, meaning of, of abuse and, and actually it totally applies to what happens to, to monkeys in captivity. Um, so although you may not see the violence, the, the cruelty um, is, is definitely there. Um, and of course it comes through, first of all, maternal deprivation. So the uh, primates are bred um, for sale. Babies and infants are taken away uh, when they're extremely young so that they are attractive and easily sort of molded to, to and have become used to human touch. Um, that social deprivation leads to them um, and not having their own kind leads to all kinds of um, psychological and emotional issues and, um, and un um, abnormal behaviour. The primates are often fed an inappropriate diet. They often fed the same diet as perhaps the, the people who care for them. Um, and that's not great. Lots of sugar, high fat, high salt diets. And of course, those pictures of the enclosures that we just looked at show that space is always going to be completely inadequate. A marmoset in a parrot cage um, is suffering um, it's incredibly when you just think that in the wild um, they would be uh, moving something like five kilometers a day um, and they are hardwired to move five kilometers a day. That's, that's what they have evolved over many millions of years to, to do and to deny them that means they're in a constant state of, of frustration. And of course, the inadequacy of their environment to these highly intelligent, highly sensitive animals means that the lack of stimulation um, is also causes an awful lot of problems. And all of this is due to a lack of education because most pet owners are not setting out to cause harm. They simply don't understand what they're doing, the difference between a domesticated animal and a non-domesticated animal. And some of them, they start to recognize that they're causing problems and they will then um, try to mitigate the problems um, and they come up with solutions which are, are not right. For instance, um, a monkey, they think, oh, he must be a little bit lonely when we're out at work all day. So what we'll do is we'll leave the dog in the garden with them. Monkeys and dogs do not go well together. The dog is frustrated, the dog wants to play, the dog wants to herd. Um, the monkey is trapped. And we have, yeah, we've had a number of monkeys come in with, with um, serious fears, um, phobias of, of dogs in this sort of situation. But the lack of education also can extend right in through um, to the veterinary trade. Um, we have, um, it, examples of animals where um, uh, owners have sought help and the advice that's been given has been totally inappropriate. For instance, trying to um, manage behavior, um, which has been caused by the captive situation um, by recommending castration. Um, and um, there's a lot of scientific evidence as well as the evidence that we see every day at the sanctuary um, to show that that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, and actually causes uh, long-term both physical and psychological harm. And the result um, speaks for itself. This is just an example of some of the animals that we have at our sanctuary. Um, and I won't sort of dwell on all the different problems, but you can see that behavioral issues are a massive issue um, for all, all monkeys that have arrived at the sanctuary. And likewise, um, physical disorders are extremely common. And we, what we have to do, of course, is try to, to mitigate the, the issues um, by offering the monkeys the best care that we can, 
by giving them um, choices in their life, by trying to divert them from the suffering that they've had um, and give them new, new options. Um, and that is a very um, both time intensive and people intensive thing that monkeys need um, understanding. They need, they need people that the carers who look after them need to really get to know them they're not going in with them, of course, but this is by through observation. It's through their understanding of the species and their needs. Um, but every individual has dealt with and has coped with their, their suffering in a different way. And we have to tailor their rehabilitation to those individuals. Um, and very commonly, I just add some of the physical suffering that goes on is, is um, High blood sugars and diabetes is extremely common and causes both again, um, um, uh, emotional, psychological and physical suffering. Um, and that can be lifelong. So the poor diet, the, um, the, the fact that they've been taken from their uh, mothers at such a young age and not had their maternal milk, um, the uh, lack of exercise, the lack of access to, to sunlight, all of these things compound to create issues like the hypoglycemia. Um, and those um, will develop um, from problems that arose when they were infants. Those, those, um, those problems will perhaps be manifested well into old age and will build on each other. Um, and metabolic bone disease is the other major issue. Um, I know Nick, who has spent time with us at, at the sanctuary, will remember um, Joey, who was a uh, fantastic character, uh, arrived at us with probably the worst metabolic bone disease that we had ever seen. And um, this is caused by lack of sunlight, poor exercise, um, particularly vitamin, lack of vitamin D3. Um, and all of those things together um, meaning that monkeys are left permanently disabled. Um, it's interesting also we're seeing with the marmosets, and you can see in the picture there that um, these orofacial clefts where um, the, um, the lack of ability because the, the monkeys have been denied the, the, the necessary D3, um, lack of sunlight, they've not been able to metabolize calcium into their bones. Um, and that all actually causes problems um, in their facial structure as well, which of course can then lead to problems of them being able to eat properly. Um, and yeah, not, not uncommon at all. We've seen this both in capuchins and in marmosets. So what do we do? Rehabilitation. Um, as a sanctuary, we offer as much space as we can. It's still, of course, inadequate. It's not what the monkeys should be having and um, what they have evolved for, um, but it's the best that we can offer. Um, and we make it very clear to the visitors who come that we consider the monkeys' enclosures, if you like, that with their indoor areas and their outdoor areas, they're like studio flats with a patio compared to what the monkeys get, um, what they should be getting in the wild. Most importantly, we, offer the, the choice and the options for the monkeys to develop their social skills, to remember how to be monkeys. And they are innately social animals. That is the most important thing for them. And to be brought up isolated from their own kind um, causes a lot of suffering. And so this is, there's always a great joy for all the carers to see just how the monkeys benefit once they're given a chance to, to be with each other again. And of course, a good diet and a varied diet um, made up with not just what we can buy from the shops, but also um, the sort of natural foraging, the plants and the trees and the leaves and the foods that we can grow um, on site at the sanctuary as well. So this gives you just a little insight into the type of enclosures that we have. As I said earlier, um, this is about um, supporting the monkey's physical, psychological and social health, and that's what goes into the design of all the enclosures. The monkeys need space, but they need choice. They don't always want to be together. They want to have, be able to go off and have quiet times as well. Um, some species have a natural fission fusion um, social structure, and we try to enable that to happen. And of course, interest and change is important. So the, I said earlier that the enclosures are linked by these runways, um, and 
what we can do is actually divide the different territories and one group will live in two or three enclosures in one space and after a few weeks we will move them to a different space and they all have a swap around and that way they get new neighbours, a new environment um, and that's, uh, that's stimulating to them, it gives them interest. So they're never always in the same place for the 20 or 30 years that we may be giving them their, their lifetime care. Um, and I think Sam touched on a bit on the legislation. Um, it is obviously inadequate in this country. Um, I mentioned earlier the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, very much geared at um, protecting people, not animals themselves. We do, as a charity, run a survey every year of all our local authorities to try to ascertain what primates are being kept where. But we also know that the majority of primates in captivity as, and being kept as pets are not those that fall under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. They're meant to be protected under the Animal Welfare Act, of course, um, and there is a code of practice specifically um, aimed at the keeping of uh, non-human primates. It's not used effectively, it's, it's too complex and not specific enough to be effective. Um, and the very fact that there are still animals out and monkeys out there being kept as, as pets shows that so many years on since this act came into force, we are still seeing a trade increasing. The international um, um, legislation has been effective in massively reducing the, the trade in the UK. Um, so that, that has helped. The Pet Animals Act, um, you're probably aware, has also done little to really help the welfare of species. So I, I said we do an annual survey. Um, what that simply shows is that the, um, that the, the existing regulatory framework doesn't, is not applied properly, it's not understood, um, and change is desperately needed. Um, as I said, the marmosets are the ones who are the, form the greatest numbers in the, in the trade. Um, it's impossible to know exactly how many there are, but you see these days um, quite a number of forums of people openly keeping, selling, breeding for the trade. And so the numbers are probably in their thousands. So current legislation definitely is failing. We need to work um, to, to, to do more to, to change things. We're constantly told by the government up to this time that um, it's all about education. We need to get people to understand that primates should not be kept as pets. And if we can just use legislation, sorry, uh, education, then legislation is not necessary. Um, but I think we have finally uh, convinced government, um, as Sam said, um, the present Tory government has pledged to end the, the, the primate pet trade. And I think that you know, with many other areas of our lives, um, it, the government has to set the moral compass and this is one of them, um, to set the example as to why this is, it's, it's just not acceptable. And I do, I do feel positive. Um, over the years, working with various other organisations, um, our colleagues in animal welfare, change has gradually happened. It's come through petitions, it's come through us all working together. It's influencing the Animal Welfare Act. We've held parliamentary receptions and had them really well attended by um, our, our members of parliament. Um, we're seeing much faster progress in Europe um, with um, you know, our colleagues out there banning and restricting trade. Um, we've had more recently um, the EFRA review and consultations into the primate pet trade. And always the recognition now is that something has got to change. Um, the promoting of the positive list, particularly in Europe, where there are now a number of countries taking less, this on, uh, means that there will be less suffering for animals. Um, and a, um, a social change where um, generally populations start as, as culturally understanding that there are some animals that simply should not be in captivity and certainly shouldn't be kept as pets. Um, and hence in the last uh, general election in the UK, um, all the main political parties um, had the ending of the primate pet trade in their manifestos, and that's for the first time ever. 
So we know that there is cross-party support for change. Um, and for us, to un underpinning all of this is the fact we've got the cultural change that's got to take place is that animals, and for us, because we're particularly passionate about primates and non-human primates, an animal's value is, is an intrinsic one. It's not an instrumental one. We, we tend as a culture to look at animals for what they can do for us and how useful they are to us. But they are so much more than that. They have their own, they're valuable in themselves. It's not about their current legal um, status as property. It's, it's about recognizing them as, as valuable and as persons in themselves. And I think that really is our Wild Futures message. I hope I haven't gone on for too long. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you, Rachel. It's really, uh, really educating. Um, great. Um, so you mentioned that um, uh, you kind of gave us a, a couple of um, like setups of how uh, the marmoset monkeys were kept in in uh, in people's houses. Uh, would you say that was typical mm -hmm. for like a privately kept primate, or how would you describe the the typical setup if if there is one? The typical setup, I would say, is a parrot cage, and it can be mm -hmm. also it can be in a hamster cage. So. I was called by the RSPCA um, last year during one of the gaps in the, between lockdown um, to go and have a look at a, a couple of primates in two different cities um, in Devon and Cornwall. Um, mm. And one of them, for instance, yes, it was a hamster cage in the living room um, next mm. to the telly on the table. Sure. Um, and that's not uncommon. And the parrot cage is, yeah, it, it's considered big. I mean, sometimes these owners uh, will ring us and say, well, we're not sure what to do. And we say, well, what size cage have they got? Oh, it's a big one. And then they send us a picture and, and that's what they mean by big. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, we have a question from, uh, from Kate, actually, which I'll read out because it kind of relates to that. She asks, um, are RSPCA inspectors helpful with the subject? Um, yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's tricky. They are always enormously short-staffed. Um, but we do work closely with them um, and we, for instance, just recently, um, one of their inspectors asked if they could come and spend some time with us so that he could raise um, his understanding. So that when he goes out and is asked to assess the welfare of, of a primate or a report um, in somebody's home, then he has got um, more information with which to to do something about it um, and I know I mean that on a national level the RSPCA is committed to ending the trade um, but we have worked very successfully with individual inspectors as well. Yeah sure okay um, you mentioned that marmosets were the most common uh, species that you're finding mm. in uh, in people's homes uh, and I think you I th uh, correct me if I'm wrong but I think you mentioned mm -hmm. that um, their numbers have been increasing in uh, in relatively recent years do you know uh, is that true and what do you think caused that kind of increase would you say if it is okay well, two things I think one is that um, it well that social media um, so one thing that I mentioned that um, some sp a, a very popular um, the, uh, previously the, most of the, the very popular species were the ones that are covered by the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. And mm. the more work we've done with local authorities and educating people about that, it means that um, authorities have been less willing to issue licenses. Um, there's also more awareness amongst the public and particularly the breeders and dealers that um, it's going to be more tricky to get to get a license. And so what they started to do is to recommend species where you don't need one. Mm -hmm. And one of the things with um, uh, if you're interested in making money and quickly is that mums that have twins. And if you take those babies away, um, then they might even have twins twice a year. So it's mm -hmm. a quick buck um, yeah, in a short space of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, great. And you, um, I think you briefly mentioned uh, Joey, the Capuchin. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe give us a couple of stories about some individuals, uh, maybe including Joey, maybe not, but uh, some individual stories of, of uh, animals in the UK. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, Joey is, is very well known. Um, and yeah, he he's actually unusually, he was a monkey who was born in the wild. So that part of his tragedy is that he had that opportunity to be living um, in the forests of South America. He was captured for the trade, um, bought by British National, um, who brought him over to the UK to be kept as her pet. Um, theoretically, he should have been protected by CITES legislation. Um, she managed to get a permit that stated that he'd been rescued from the wild. You know, if you know the right people who know the right things to say, almost anything gets through. Um, he was then, um, he was then brought, yeah, he basically then lived the next nine years of his life um, in a parrot cage. Um, in uh, somebody's house. Um, he originally started with a Dangerous Wild Animals Act license, but it was never renewed. So as he grew and as his suffering increased, um, the authorities never got to see him again. So he, he dropped out of sight and out of mind um, until he was effectively abandoned um, by um, his owner um, and his neighbor reported uh, his suffering to us. Um, after nine years of no access to natural sunlight, uh, with no exercise um, and a poor diet, he had the most terrible case of metabolic bone disease that we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, it also affected his major organs um, and he was also catatonic. So the frustration, the boredom, the lack of stimulation meant that when we first rescued him, he would spend the majority 23 hours a day rocking. If he wasn't sleeping, he was just rocking back and forth um, to the point where we considered that euthanasia might have been the, the, the kindest thing because that level of psychological suffering and the vets actually urged us to, to go forward with that. Um, mm. We just said, give us a couple of weeks. Let's see if given the chance he can break out of that, that state. Um, and everybody who knows Joey knows that he was absolutely amazing because given that couple of weeks once he realized that there were monkeys to talk to that he had an opportunity to explore and to, to move um, he grasped that opportunity with everything that he had um, and he spent the next 12 years with us um, a part of a, a social group and a dominant character with it for everybody who knew him including all his monkey friends so yeah a, a terrible suffering but a, a wonderful character in the end He's given gave us awful, an awful lot yeah. and became quite an ambassador uh, for his species as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one I'd perhaps talk about, I mean, a typical um, marmoset um, would be Indy, uh, as who's a, a marmoset again, lived all her life on her own in a parrot cage. Um, metabolic bone disease means that her teeth have not formed well, which means that she has some trouble. Um, with the, the you know, hard foods, with, um, uh, with some parts of her diet, we adapt things for her. Um, she was very, she, when she first arrived, she was very aggressive. Um, and we had been told by people who knew her that they were concerned that she would never be able to socialize. Again, given the opportunity, she now has a, a lovely partner and best friend called Jerry. And they, they live very well together, indeed. And he basically does what she says, and that's what yeah. she wants. And that, that works well. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Amazing stuff. Um, we've got a question from, uh, from Suzanne in the audience. Um, they're asking, what do you estimate the proportion of primate pets are wild caught as opposed to captive bred uh, now in the UK? Um, I would say 99% are probably captive in the UK, this is so it's a very different situation in other European countries, um, it's particularly, for instance, um, where there is easy access to North Africa, so via and into Spain, um, and we've got more porous uh, European borders. Um, but one of the advantages of us being an island um, is that 
that kind of um, yet yeah, trade is, is more limited. Um, another question uh, relating to your previous point about uh, vets. Um, Elizabeth asks, how do you educate vets who end up uh, seeing monkeys as, as, pa as patients? Um, well, obviously we're open to the public. Um, we publish material. Um, we run workshops. Um, so um, one of the things we've done, for instance, is had a, um, a day um, where we will we, we run a series of talks by different experts in the field. Um, and we will invite um, veterinary surgeons and local authorities um, and um, university leaders um, and animal care colleges um, to come and, and, yeah, and learn about the issues um, and, and network that way. Yeah, great. Um, I guess I hate to mention it, but COVID. Um, yeah. What... Uh, um, as you kind of touched on, what's uh, what's been the impact of COVID on on the work of Wild Futures, but also what's been kind of the impact of COVID on uh, the primates living in people's houses and uh, kind mm. of and still in in that dire situation. Yeah, you know? yeah, a really a good question. I mean, I should say because we all know what it what COVID has been like in these last 14, 15 months have been really hard for many many people. Um, and we are fortunate um, in that um, none of us have been ill and the monkey, we've managed to keep the monkeys safe. And that's really important uh, because monkeys are primates and so are we, and non-human primates are highly susceptible to COVID. Um, we don't know with all the different species just to what extent um, they are vulnerable, um, but we know that they can definitely catch COVID. So the immediate impact was that we had to stop all our face-to-face um, -face educational work, um, close to the public um, and stop having universities and schools visiting. Um, that of course had a massive impact on our um, finances um, because a lot of the money that, that runs the sanctuary um, comes in through our supporters who, who visit us. Um, we had to set up very strict protocols to keep the monkeys and the staff um, and the, the team that look after them um, protected. So we've had to set up zones. We work with PPE, masks, gloves. Um, we, you know, it, all, taking all our hygiene levels um, up a step. Um, we've had to form working bubbles. Um, and yeah, I mean, all the things that people have had to do with each other in their normal workplace, and we've had to do that mm. with, with the monkeys themselves as well. Mm. And I think one of the things I find really distressing is for instance, we have to wear masks um, to keep the monkeys protected. And that means the monkeys can't see our full expressions uh, while we're working with them and trying to um, reassure them and help them understand. And they've got used to it, but it's like cutting off part of our communication ability, yeah. So it's not been easy, um, both financially and um, on a practical level. But I, I would say our team has been absolutely amazing because the stresses and the strains and the impact of working in this way is not inconsiderable. Um, mm -hmm. And they've kept going through all the way through it to ensure that the monkeys are, are kept safe and get the high level of care. And we've also, also, I should say, we normally have a large number of volunteers coming through and staying with us, and we've had to reduce that drastically in order to keep everybody safe within the household as well. Mm. So we're all doing double the work yeah. <laughs> as well as. <laughs> well, it sounds, it sounds tough, but amazing work that you guys are doing. Um, you mentioned um, that uh, a while ago, um, a good few decades ago that the sanctuary made the decision to move to non-breeding sanctuary. Mm. Uh, we've got a question from Susie just asking uh, how you prevent the primates from breeding at the sanctuary. Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, we basically use, um, most of the time we use vasectomy. So we vasectomize all the male primates that come in. The advantage of that is that as far as the monkeys know, there is no difference. So they can continue 
an important part of their social life and so they can mate, they can spend time together, but doesn't result in, in any births. Um, we have had to vary that at times. So with some species, we've used the contraceptive pill um, because um, the social structure is more, um, is more suited to that. Um, and I will say we've had a couple of accidents along the way where some babies have been born, but um, yeah, we, um, the, the vasectomy is the very, the very effective way of doing it. And castration is really not the way to do it because of the um, both physical, physiological and psychological effects that it has on, on the monkeys. Yeah, sure. Um, so you kind of touched on the, uh, the government's pledge to, to ban the trade. Um, mm. uh, and as I mentioned, there was this, uh, the recent consultation on uh, a proposal put forward by DEFRA to, uh, to, to ban the keeping and um, trading of primate pets. Um, included within that was the kind of a proposal for a new a license, a specialist private primate keeper license mm. uh, for kind of private keepers who keep their primates to zoo level standards. Um, I was wondering what your view was on DEFRA's proposal, whether how much you see it as a, a victory and how much work's still to be done and how close we are to finally. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay. I think there is much lacking in the proposed legislation. Our concern is, for instance, the specialist keeper licenses. Mm. Um, in our opinion, and and we would say it's a very informed opinion, um, it's uh, there is no justification for keeping primates in a domestic setting under any circumstances, mm. um, and. I think even the, the BVA, British Veterinary Association, as they put it, even if you were able to find a couple of people who kept primates in some amazing, fantastic conditions um, that was better than a zoo and not comparable to the average domestic household, um, it is worth sacrificing those, those conditions um, in order to enforce a law effectively and basically our experience and experience of um, legislators um, around Europe is that the more black and white the legislation the more effective it is and if you send out a really clear message which says it is not socially or legally acceptable to keep primates as pets then that works far better than having a kind of grey area where maybe in some conditions it's okay. Yeah, sure. However, the very fact that there is the government is even considering legislation is something that we are very grateful for, yeah. and we will definitely work with that, um, and then and then seek to improve things as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just following on from that, we got a question from Mark saying uh, asking why the government's been reluctant to ban the trade up until now. Yeah, why I think it's ban? almost a philosophical reason um, and uh, so culturally that uh, we have never banned the keeping of any animal other than under the Dangerous Dogs Act mm. um, and hence governments of all colours have always said to us well what we need to do is simply educate people into not keeping species we'd rather do that than act as the nanny state um, mm. I think we finally convinced them that as we tell people that they it's not morally acceptable um, to steal we put legislation in place to to show that the government has that moral compass you, know, you shouldn't steal rather than just relying on on education mm. it's the same in the uh, case of animal welfare yeah, sure. typically keeping primates as pets absolutely and um, we've got another question just coming actually going back to um the breeding issue uh just michelle asked by preventing um the breeding of the primates does yeah. it have any emotional or psychological effects on uh, breeding aged females or other um, it must do I and mean, we can't deny that part of their natural biology um, and ecology would be to have have infants and for all of them because that's part of being a, a social group um, however if they're breeding of course we are perpetuating 
um, a, a captive situation and a situation in which there is inherently difficult for them. Mm. For many of the, the monkeys, they arrive in a psychological and physical state where they couldn't deal with being parents or look by the going through a hot pregnancy and or caring for young appropriately. Um, so no, it's a, yeah, it's it's a compromise, but we feel a, a necessary one. Sure. Well, um, yeah, that's all the questions I have, unless anyone else would like to uh, drop one in the chat quickly. Um, we'll round things up. Um, I had a question. Um, ah. It's <laughs> a question that we get in various forms um, as part of our work when we're obviously campaigning for um, zoos to close who are holding wild animals captive. Mm. Um, and I wonder what you can identify um, as the main differences between a sanctuary versus a zoo. Okay, yes. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we founded the European Alliance of Rescue Centres and Sanctuaries because our work is inherently different. Um, it's about welfare, rescue and welfare. So a sanctuary provides lifelong care for animals that have suffered in inappropriate conditions. Um, the true definition of a sanctuary must include the fact that they are non-breeding, so they're not perpetuating the captive situation. Um, what we're doing is providing the best welfare that we can within that captive situation. And so the it's the needs of that the, the the aims and the focus of a sanctuary are very much aimed at um, the individual welfare of the of the the rescued animals there, um, and secondary to that comes the the interests of the the people. And we are open to the public because it's a major um, it, it's it's an a very important way that we can actually fund the work that we do um, but it, the way that we open is is also limited there's no monkey that's forced to be on view they always have areas that they can disappear there are some individuals who just never want to be seen and so we ensure that they are in areas that um, cannot be seen by the, the public so the whole focus is on the animals themselves mm -hmm. um, and um, and yeah, our visitors and 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 even the carers themselves, they come. We we come second. Yes, interesting. Is that a good Thank one? Um, yeah. Change? Yeah. No, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Great. Right. Um, I did have another question as well, actually, um, which is about the sort of challenge that sanctuaries have, and I, and I know that the sanct the monkey sanctuaries have this as well in terms of having enough space for the number of individuals that require sanctuary um which yeah. again i think you know something interesting to talk about because um we are in that position where we do call for places to close down and that the lack of space of sanctuary is a challenge mm. um and you know something that we talk about a lot um so yeah again just be interested to hear what you think on that you're you're right it's a major issue um there simply aren't enough places and so we and we know other sanctuaries are turning away and tur turning down opportunities of rescue which is heartbreaking because we know that those animals need care mm -hmm. um, but we simply don't have the physical space um and that is constrained by by funds and also just our footprint you know that we've got that, that, that mm -hmm. our charity owns the land that we own um, it means, for instance, in the, the forthcoming legislation that we have had to agree to what we call a grandfather clause. So for those individual animals that are kept in slightly better conditions um, until uh, a sanctuary place can be kept for them, their owners will be allowed to keep them. Um, and yeah, which does not sit comfortably but as long as they're also not allowed to to breed or to trade mm -hmm. we hope that it's a temporary situation um, but yet yeah, there if there are thousands of uh, primates out there in the pet trade um, there's certainly not thousands of places available and one of the big 
issues um, in sanctuaries um, as well, which we need to be really careful about, is that people often start very well intentioned and they start to rescue and they have um, some, you know, some decent space and facilities and then they carry on rescuing and they carry on rescuing beyond their own capacity. And the danger of that, of course, is that um, the animals they rescue can end up in, um, you know, in really poor conditions. And that then has a knock on effect on educational work because you've got to convince the public that animals are not suited to life in captivity. And mm -hmm. if you call yourself a, a sanctuary and you've got your monkeys living in really poor conditions, then you're, you're contradicting that, that educational message. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we need, we need more sanctuaries and more properly regulated sanctuaries. Thank you. But we, we would love to be out of work. <laughs> Our dream <laughs> is that one day we, we, we're not needed and wild futures can focus on um, conservation um, and not need to worry about um, there's, there's monkeys that have suffered in the trade in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was wonderful to hear about your the kind of holistic policy of Wild Futures working on, you know, promoting the plant-based diet, uh, mm -hmm. conservation efforts in the on site, and uh, and helping projects overseas as well. It's mm -hmm. really great to to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Um, great. So, um, thank you, everyone, for for attending our webinar. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for um, for your help here, and thank you, Rachel, um, for your the wonderful work of Wild Futures and for giving us that really educating talk about the issues and and the work that you're doing. Uh, so great! Uh, thank you, everyone. Check out uh, Wild Futures online. Uh, check out Freedom for Animals online for um, our upcoming campaigns on the issue, and we look forward to some kind of proper legislative change hopefully shortly, but um, in the pipeline sometime soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, I should say and thanks to all our, our amazing team at Wild Futures for putting the work they do. Absolutely. It's, it's due to them. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.